Okay, welcome everybody this morning, the second day, the morning of the second day of our uh, symposium on neurophenomenology and secular architecture. Uh, we have plenty of uh, activists today. I'm saying this a little bit more for the recording than for anything else because everybody's here. Uh, we have two uh, panel this morning uh, and uh, we're gonna go through that. Those panels are not being broadcast in real time to the webinar as a webinar uh, on the internet, but they will be recorded. Uh, so they will be eventually online uh, for public ac access. Uh, so that's that's the kind of the plan. So the first, uh, these, these panels we created uh, with, with short presentation, about 10 to 15 minutes, um, hopefully 12 minutes, uh, in which people could quickly present where they are working or the ideas or issues uh, and therefore, uh, we have a kind of a, a quick overview of the the, 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 the the focus of the of the panel. And then we engage in conversation that we did a little bit like yesterday uh, after the uh, Anjan's uh, talk, uh, and also, of course, open this uh, for um, everybody else's uh, questions and answers. So that's that's the plan. Uh, so what uh, how this is going to uh, move forward, so I'm going to invite each uh, presenter this morning. Uh, and they want to come presenting the podium their 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 work, and then I'm going to call the second, the third, and the fourth, and eventually we're going to sit here and we're going to engage in conversation. The first panel of today, uh, which I moderated, uh, this is uh, we call it works uh, empirical works. So there are four uh, individuals doing concrete uh, empirical studies uh, on neuroscience, architecture, phenomenology, a combination of all these. Uh, and I think it's really important to see what was happening in the field. So that's that's what what uh, today's uh, um, first panel. So let me then um, introduce uh, first uh, speaker today, uh, Tom Boudin. Um, he uh, is a professor of religion at Fordham University in New York City, um, and he's studying the, the entanglement of cultural practices, if you wish, Christian theologies and spiritual exercises. He's currently conducting research about visitor experience at the amazing Pantheon in Rome, and just look forward to see what the news are on that. Uh, that is also sponsored by the Templeton Religion Trust. So Tom, please uh, come and give us your talk. Is this okay here? Perfect, yeah. And to advance, I use that. Just correct. Yeah, first. Right. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So since 2004, I have been studying the Pantheon in Rome. To describe my empirical research, I should begin by acknowledging that I do so as a theologian who has made myself a student of one basic question for my whole career. What do theological studies and cultural practices have to do with each other? More simply, how does creativity around God relate to creativity in our life? From this perspective, I'm grateful to be here today because I think theology works better when it is in the midst of other fields and forms of knowledge and practice. Theology for me should be an experimental discipline, putting to the test inherited normativities and seeing if and how they still serve. A theological disposition for me is not about announcing, but about searching, about listening, about helping people hold their lives together and tend the mystery of their lives. My research at the Pantheon is a rather loosely integrated aggregation of theological forms of attention, informed by social science and concerned for the politics of knowledge, including the cultural stakes and uses of intellectual productions. I'm going to explain what this means. I'm gonna operationalize this. So by saying that my research is a loosely aggregated constellation of theological forms of attention, I mean, there are multiple ways that I take up a bearing research-wise toward the Pantheon. Number one, 
Reflective reckoning with my experience and memories of the Pantheon. Number two, learning from texts about Pantheon research. Third, conducting ethnography at the Pantheon. Fourth, survey research about visitor experience. Fifth, articulating reflexivity. That means critically surfacing the self as the key research instrument in qualitative work. Sixth, creating and learning from interventions. Now, my reflective reckoning commenced with my initial encounter with the architecture and the environment nearly 20 years ago when my wife and I visited the Pantheon. I remember being surprised, being mystified, being enchanted, being ensnared. The building lived on in my memory and imagination fed by continued visits. During the entire ensuing empirical research process right up to today, I am never far from a body-minded placement in that space, from the built environment that I carry within me. Maybe you have buildings like that as well. This form of attention involves practices like savoring my experience and memories, describing them, accounting for them, and clarifying them. A distinct form of attention involves consulting texts. Historical and architectural research helps me understand how the Pantheon came to be, how it changed over time, what it has meant to its curators and visitors over 2,000 years. These texts offer theories and historical documentation, of course, for an empirical investigation. But the texts also enliven and complexify memories, enliven and complexify my visits, and they inform future visits. So a research question gradually formed. What does the Pantheon mean? For whom and how? In the literature, this and beyond, I noticed the nearly complete absence, not only of theological treatments, but of empirical attention to visitor experience. In 2019, I began an ethnographic theological study, trying better to understand from the ground up how the Pantheon works. Because the Pantheon has been a Catholic church for about the last 1400 years, now known today as the Basilica of Mary and the Martyrs, my qualitative work began by reaching out to Pantheon Catholic leadership to try to develop a partnership so that I could not only meet my research goals, but to help them meet their ministerial goals. This evolving partnership has been essential to this research on architecture and spirituality. The Pantheon is, as you know, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and in this sense, it belongs to the world. It is owned by the state of Italy, and so in that sense, it's a national monument, but its religious identity and mission is curated by the Roman Catholic Church. As a theologian, I felt a particular obligation and desire to connect respectfully and creatively with the religious authorities, thinking that they have a stake in my research, they agreed, and that they could help or hinder my research. Building my relationships with these Pantheon personnel, I committed myself to field work in the space. So far, I have interviewed 20 workers uh, in the Pantheon, from clergy to gift desk to security, et cetera, tour guides. I've taken countless photos and videos. Uh, I've spent 160 hours inside the Pantheon in participant observation, keeping field notes and a research journal about the somatic capital and, and bodily wherewithals involved in being in this space. The next research, uh, the turn in the research happened in 2021, when with the help of the Templeton Religion Trust, I opened a pilot quantitative wing of the project. I designed and implemented a voluntary survey of Pantheon visitors for anyone who's ever gone, ever, at least once, that was completed last summer, by 1,525 visitors who answered questions and wrote in descriptions of their experience of the architecture and the art. 
with an eye toward what counts for them as spiritually or religiously significant. Within these surveys, in addition to the quantitative data about thoughts, feelings, and bodily responses to the Pantheon, participants also wrote out their experience. We have 5,400 written comments about Pantheon experience, ranging from a few words to several paragraphs. The survey was informed by research in architecture and spirituality, and by the spiritual expectations of the clergy who work and serve there. As I work to interpret that data, my initial and ongoing associations to the architecture in light of these other methods have begun to show me how the architecture functions symbolically for me as a researcher, that is existentially and politically. My motivations, my knowledge, and my forms of ignorance are at work in the research. Tracking my entanglement in the research makes reflexivity another source of understanding the pantheon. This requires putting myself in question continually and charting what it is possible for me to know, not only in terms of being a theologian, but also being of Roman Catholic heritage, being a white man, being a white man in a historically white dominant university, a historically Christian centric Catholic university. All these contribute to my knowledge, but also to my ignorance. In this Pantheon work, I am partnering with an almost exclusively white male Catholic European leadership in studying a monument whose architecture has served startlingly diverse political purposes. This slide shows a bookshelf in my home office. This is my slide about reflexivity. I consider that reflexivity in empirical research requires not only thinking through our contingency as researchers and our epistemic advantages and our epistemic disadvantages, but in practicing critical openness to what we learn about ourselves as researchers that may not accord with our self-perception, that we learn from the feedback and the critique of others who participate in our research. This is called critical intersubjectivity in the particular stream of qualitative research that I follow. Part of the experimental character of theology, I think, is creating intellectual artifacts, which are interventions into situations. For me, this includes a presentation like this. Publish articles and chapters, the social media I maintain for this project, reports to my Roman Catholic leadership partners, and updates to the hundreds of people who have signed up for the project's email list, and I often get feedback from them about the project. Here is a report I recently compiled for the Pantheon leadership. This is the top line of the survey findings, uh, and it's just an interim report, so it's not really public public, but I'm happy to share it with anyone here who is interested in it. The conversations and the feedback occasioned by these interventions go back into the empirical findings, the critical intersubjectivity. Make the intervention, get the feedback, correct myself, make the adjustment, reframe. In this presentation, I have focused on the research process. While I'd like to unveil in detail the findings of the ethnography and the survey, I'll be ready to, much more ready to do so starting this fall, although in the conversation in this weekend, I'm also happy to talk about what we're learning so far. In the meantime, as I said, I can share this report with anyone who's interested. And uh, as the work continues, though, I realize I have much to learn from this gathering. I hope to understand better why visiting the Pantheon has made such a difference for the lives of many people over nearly 2,000 years, and perhaps how my approach can be connected or even extended to analogous research at other religious heritage spaces that are publicly significant. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Tom. Elisabetta Canepa will be next. Elisabetta um, is an architect and researcher from uh, Genoa, Italy. She's a Marie Curie, Curie Fellow running the Resonances Project with the University of Genoa. Um, Kansas uh, State University and Alberg University. Her research focuses on architectural atmospheres, embodiment theory, empathic relationship between humans and space, and experimentations with uh, virtual reality. Uh, Elisabetta, please. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> so I feel really honored to be part of this panel and enjoy the general topic of the symposium, which is so fascinating that you can get lost very easily, I think. So, oh, which is the one? Yeah. Okay. okay. So when we say sacred, many meanings emerge. If we search for a subjective meaning, um, even without a direct connection uh, to the religious faith and worship, we define as a sacred that which is connected with the experience of a completely different reality, something higher, greater than ourselves that makes us um, feel engaged and that we regard with reverence and respect. One of the most remarkable aspects of a sacred experience, especially for the discussion uh, this morning together, is that sacred experiences are always situated. Evoking a question that I like to borrow from our friend Sarah Robinson, that will join us um, in the upcoming panel about neurophenomenology, I want to ask you to close your eyes and recall a moment of your life, whatever. If it is a sacred experience, uh, would be even better. Can you recall that event without also remembering the place where the memory was born? Nope, I think you can't, because we always need a place to nest our lived experiences. Space, especially built space as the basis for life and culture, is never neutral. It is rather charged with affective affordances, that is emotional, environmental mutations that influence the experience of the subject living and moving through that space. Drawing on the lesson provided by Yuani Palasma, we can define the notion of atmospheres as the general overarching perceptual, sensory, and emotional impressions afforded by, the, by a place, an event, or a social situation. This overall impression is a generator of identity and meaning. Sacred spaces can be the ideal testbed for the study uh, of atmospheres since they provoke profound emotional reactions that make these dynamics even more evident and thus more understandable. As a unity of lived qualities, atmospheres are never fully graspable or definable. Almost all literature about architectural atmospheres warns about their inherent ineffability. How we can locate, analyze, and measure something that we can see, something that is incorporeal, which is a property seen more indefinable on a level of perception. To try to answer this question, we design an experimental protocol focused on our first impressions. First impressions are profound and very informative events. We are great at extracting meaningful information from a complex visual scenes, static or in motion, only with a glance and without examining each detail. Yoni Palasma highlights the atmospheric vocation of architecture um, experience by saying people primarily see the overall atmospheres when they experience a place or building. Attention to visible forms, details comes later, especially if we are architects, 
or we adopt an intellectual and theoretical approach. But first impressions talk about atmosphere. They observe atmosphere. They are made of atmosphere. In our experiment, we suppose that different atmospheric factors, which can be physiological, personal, sociocultural, environmental, or experimental, prime in a different way the first impressions we have of a place. That is what we call resonance. Resonance unfolds our innate predisposition to be emotionally affected by the external world. First impressions reveal through basic modalities, through emotions, which are internal somatic feedback, not consciously developed, even if sometimes consciously recognizable, like when we sense, as in this moment, our pounding heart. Through expressions, which are outward physiological and proprioceptive feedback, mostly no conscious. Um, like when our face flashes and our high browns twitch. Through action tendencies, which are behavioral feedback, mostly no conscious, like when we sense a huge to leave the room where we are. And eventually feelings, which are cognitive feedback of the emotional experience as consciously felt. Emotions, expressions, and actions are the bodily correlates of feelings, mutually interacting and influencing. For example, we may sense our heart pounding, that is what we call the emotion component, and consciously feel nervous, that is the feeling component. I'll show you an image now. <laughs> Please try to describe it in your mind just uh, with three words very quickly. Even before we can understand, it is the Basilica di San Francesco di Assisi, San Francis in English, we can appreciate the peaceful atmosphere, the beauty of the landscape, and the cheerful play of the kids. So in theory, I think a really pleasant impression. Not in my case. Uh, I went there the first time with my grandma, and she wasn't the usual lovely figure that we are used to seeing when we think about grandma. So quite the opposite. And my first impressions with this image um, were prime tinted uh, by my memory immediately. And my perception of this place, of this image, immediately changed. There was something that primed this kind of experience. In our experiment, we analyzed a series of corridors where we alter the light quality by luminosity and color, assuming light is a primary generator of atmosphere. So we aim to understand if and how different atmospheres prime the emotional experience of the next room by focusing on our first impressions. In other words, we don't test atmosphere per se, that is invisible, something that we can touch, we can define, but as a priming condition for architectural experience. The subjects resonance with the atmosphere of the corridor might prime them to perceive the subsequent room in a different way. If they, even if this room is always the same. We don't expect to finding a priming effect if subjects don't significantly resonate with the atmosphere of the corridor. To understand the circular interaction between atmospheric affordances, the subject's body resonance, and their effective appraisals, we combine a first-person perspective using self-report questionnaires with a third-person perspective, measuring the autonomic nervous system activity. Each session was composed of four sequences, presented randomly, and explorable in a free way in virtual reality. People entered the first room, ran a Relaxation, re relaxation exercise, allowing us to collect some baseline data. Open at the first room, walked along the corridor in a very natural way, open the second door and explore the art installation in front of them before replying to a brief questionnaire, popping up directly in virtual reality. 
The first room and the final room never changed. They were always the same. The first room was an empty square room with white surfaces and two wooden cubes for participants to sit on and take a brief break after each sequence. And for modeling the final room, we took inspiration from a project by the Argentinian architect Emilia Ambas. We know atmosphere is a very, 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 very complex process, but the scientifically controllable, controllable experiment asked for a reductionist approach, suggesting work on one potential atmospheric design factor at a time to ensure a correlation between stimuli and reactions. As previously said, my first generator of atmosphere uh, was light. So from our atlas of atmospheric stimuli, we are more than 70 corridors, we selected four settings. A bright corridor in continuity with the first room, an amber corridor, a blue teal corridor in continuity with the atmosphere of the final room, and a dark corridor. In this experiment, we observe first impressions in terms of emotions, that is, somatic components no consciously developed, and feelings, that is, the cognitive appraisal of the emotional experience as consciously felt. The only behavioral variable we analyze is the time spent in each corridor to understand if there is a correlation between the priming effect of atmosphere, of the corridor atmosphere, and people's uh, speed. Many parameters exist to describe emotions, but two components are considered to reflect the basic dimensions characterizing emotion and feelings in daily life, arousal and balance. Arousal is the dimension that defines the intensity of the felt emotional state, that is, how strong the reaction is. And to monitor is its physiological behavior, we recorded three markers. So electrodermal activity, heart rate, and skin temperature. The cognitive component was evaluated with a question to understand how much people, no, yeah, how much people felt activated by their surroundings. And they, they answer using a five point liquor scale where by one we meant not at all and by five we meant extremely. Balance described the extent to which an emotional state is positive or negative, that is pleasant or unpleasant. Combining arousal and balance, we identify the emotions as consciously felt with satisfying um, precision. No conscious data were collected using eye, track te eye tracking technology uh, to see how the priming effect might influence their visual, visual behavior. The cognitive component was evaluated with a question to understand how much people change their minds about feeling happy in the final room. So the final room was always the same, so, but maybe they could feel, feel in a different way. And again, they answered using a five point Laker scale. So here is our lab, the Perception Lab 2003, directed by Professor Bob Konya at Kansas State University at the Department of Architecture. Professor Kutai Guler is our virtual reality and eye tracking expert, and they are our amazing lab assistants. So Brittany, Beth, Amanda, and Jacob. Together, we were able to test more than 100 people using our protocol. So, Several people told us that the final room looked different, even if it was always the same. We are now processing data, so we have to see if there is also statistical evidence. We are in the middle of the process. I'm so grateful to be here today and not in front of my laptop with Excel worksheet. Um, and it would be interesting to understand if our atmospheres were able to prime our experience. Because as architects, we can change our grammars, as in my case, but probably we can design priming atmosphere and interact with people's emotional experiences. That's all. It's just a presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Elisabetta. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Robin Jensen. Uh, she's a Patrick O'Brien Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, where she holds concurrent faculty position in the Departments of Art, 
art history and design and classics. Her research and teaching mainly concentrates on the history of Christian art and architecture and integrates material evidence with lived religious practices. Robin, please. When we're getting up here, I'll just explain that I live between a lot of worlds. I'm in a theology department and in an art history department. And I've worked with architects a lot um, over my life, but my children are both architects. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm in a good company, although I'm not one of you exactly. Um, so this is, um, somehow we, how do we, uh, what? Just, this just board. Someone's kind of top line. And maybe this is the, Let's see, I guess. Uh, don't worry about it. Right. No, it's okay. Sure. I guess it's uh, just cut up a little bit. I have two Templeton grants. We've had two Templeton grants, and this is going to be a lot of moving parts. So oh, I bet. that's all right. Um, People at home won't see that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, actually the second term has started in the three-year grant. We had a two-year grant. I'm working, while I know quite a lot about history of theology, history of Christian art and architecture, even archaeology and art history, um, I don't know anything about cognitive science. So I'm... <laughs> I'm really I'm working with two cognitive scientists in the psych department, um, and so we're a team of three. Uh, Jim Brockmull is a cognitive psychology and visual cognition specialist, and Gabriel Radvansky works with memory and cognition studies. So um, I'm, uh, I'm here representing a group of people about which I'm only a third of any knowledge of what we're doing exactly. We're also working with people in virtual reality and eye tracking studies. Um, who are specialists in the department, as well as people from art and art history. So that's our, it's a big group. Um, and our primary question that has guided both of these uh, two parts, these two part grant is how and to what extent does viewing sacred art inform and enhance spiritual understanding? And so there's some general questions uh, here. Um, are there differences in how viewers engage with and remember sacred art versus art without any religious content? So we are studying two kinds of art and trying to study the differences in how viewers engage with these different types of art. We also are interested in genre, so we're asking, are there differences in how viewers engage with representational and non-representational sacred and non-sacred art? In other words, uh, images that are pictorial and images that are completely non-pictorial or abstract. Um, another thing is a uh, question about individual differences. Do our viewers respond according differently according to age, gender, educational background, artistic knowledge, cultural identity, or religious affiliation? So that's a big part of our study. We're trying to get biographies of, the, of our subjects so we can kind of place them on a spectrum in all of these ways, um, especially uh, at Notre Dame. We, we are also working with Baylor University so we can get a few non-Catholics into our study as well as Catholics at least. And we may carry that further with opening up the study more broadly to the general public. Um, finally, we want to know about event structure. How does the structure of the experiencing event influence visitors or viewers' understanding and memory of the event? Um, do the physical or temporal context of the viewing experience affect viewers' engagement and memory of the work? So it's both the immediate engagement, also memory one day later and maybe two weeks later of, of the event. And so they evaluate. We do this uh, combination of eye tracking uh, studies as well as some other kinds of studies and also interviews with uh, our subjects to see how they would not only describe their experience in many on many different spectrums of pleasant to unpleasant, um, inspirational to non-inspirational, boring to exciting, but also how much they remember of the, the images themselves. So who are the viewers is one of our major questions. We wanna know about them. We wanna know where this viewing is taking place. Um, is it taking place in an art gallery, a museum, a church, a dorm room? a dining hall, uh, uh, an office, um, and so forth. And does that a spatial uh, setting of the viewing also strongly influence the ways that our viewers respond to the work? In some ways, I would say this began for me with a simple question that I always wanted to know uh, over the years of teaching. I teach a course in history of Christian art and, how, uh, and history of Christian Christian architecture. But I was also wondering what happens when you move a sacred piece of art out of a church or a chapel and into the museum, does the viewer respond differently 
um, to that work? And can you respond devotionally to an artwork that's actually in a museum? So um, I found this on the website of the Worcester Museum of Art um, when they invited people to pray to works that were in their museum uh, galleries. Um, and this happened to me when I was living in Nashville and we had an exhibition of artworks that were Dominican and Franciscan and actually um, invited people to stop and pray. We even gave them like here a pray do in which they could kneel if they wanted to and invited uh, uh, choirs of Dominican nuns in to sing um, during the times that visitors might be in the museum. And I was, I wished at the time I had some way of having measured the, the impact of those experiences on the viewers to a, a, what is a pretty secular museum in downtown Nashville. So this is also what is driving or drove my initial interest in this project and was the sort of way that this grant process got underway. Um, I won't try to read all of that, but you can come back to it. The second is the differences in content. Um, is this a religious content? Is it a narrative content? Um, uh, or is it purely secular? Or can we always tell the difference? So um, we could look at something like this um, or something like that and try to imagine how viewers encounter these uh, differently. And that might have a lot to do with their own religious background and their knowledge of the stories that they're seeing portrayed in, in the images. So again, we're coming around with all these moving parts to know what kind of viewers we're working with and, and how much did they bring already to the viewing experience from their own knowledge and training. Um, and then we were very interested in the differences between representational and non-representational works. Um, so, so we started with two distinct sites. One of them was in our campus. Uh, it's not a chapel. It's a full basilica and it's very elaborate and it has very large stations of the cross. And I'll show you one of these in a minute. And we also used another site, which was an outdoor sculpture uh, park installation of uh, 14 installations that are similar to Stations of the Cross, but they're not representational in the traditional way. We had some COVID-19 restrictions initially, so we couldn't actually go around with people and follow their experiences. So we tried something I'll show you in a minute of you know, manipulating projected images. And we did eye tracking measurements and we followed up with interviews. And our conclusions um, initially we're at the point of encounter, abstract sacred art is characterized by a broader scope of attention and higher levels of arousal and cognitive effort as viewers seek to, con to connect their perceptual experiences to some kind of meaning. That doesn't mean they liked the abstract art. They sometimes really hated it, but we found that they remembered it better and they reported a higher level of arousal with them, negative and positive, which was really interesting. When we're calling the sacred art, the arousal and emotional engagement led to better superficial memory for representational art than for representational art, sorry, and better interpretive memory for the abstract art. And so while artistic style affects the understanding of sacred art in environmental context as manipulated may not play, uh, this is another thing we learned, such an emotional or a significant role in the experience itself. So this is just an example of what we started with, with the uh, Basilica Stations of the Cross. And you can see that they're very traditional, uh, late 19th century paintings, very large. Um, and students, in fact, um, reported that they liked these a lot better, but they didn't remember them as well when we asked them uh, later. And I think it's because they thought they already knew what was in them. Um, and so they were kind of just passing them by in some sense, sort of spending less time looking at them. Compared to these, these are the outdoor installation works um, by Philip Ricky, and they were done in 2017. The students that are subject reported not liking these. Some of them even said, that's just a bunch of stones, um, a big pile of stones, but they remembered them better and they had a higher levels of arousal in studying them, which was fascinating for us. We also tried uh, both studies during Lent and during ordinary time to see if students had different reactions. And we're still working on trying to measure and uh, quantify all of that. But we generally think that especially for the interior stations of the cross, students had a much higher level of memory and uh, time spent looking at them during a, during a high liturgical season like Lent when uh, stations of the cross are really used. Here's some just some more uh, images of these uh, stations um, and they're in, 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 thinking about things other people have said today. One of the things that's very important about this is environment. If you're inside our basilica, it's a very Victorian Gothic revival church, very elaborate. 
Um, and this is outside and it's a lot to do with the environment. You can see the tall grasses, the winds blowing. There's a lot of wonderful smells. Um, it's, a, it's a bodily movement. It's much more, in, um, requires a lot more walking um, around and circle, circumambulating these spaces. Um, so there are 14 interesting stations here. You can tell that this is a, 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 meant to be representational in a way, it's a crucifixion. Um, and then this is the last one in the stations and nobody really knows what this is. And so everybody has to interpret it in different ways. These are not labeled. Um, the artist didn't tell you what he intended for these. Um, and so I've had students um, say, this is everything from the, the, the burial of Christ to the four gospels, to the ascension of Christ, to the second coming. <laughs> So it's uh, it's really open-ended and it's been kind of wonderful to sort of have students tell me what they think as they encounter these different uh, spaces. And then in order to manipulate these and try to see what happens if you move artworks into different environments, we actually superimposed um, both sets of stations on different kinds of backgrounds and then projected them and students looked at them on uh, iPads. Um, as well with eye tracking happening as well. And then they reported their responses. If we superimpose them on something like a casino or our football stadium, <laughs> and we, we really actually wanted to project one of these on footballs, on the football jumbotron when you're during a football game. We didn't get permission to do that, but I'm hoping we can actually one day do that and see what happens. Um, okay. So the new Next phase of this grant, which we're moving on into, is that we're, we're still keeping some of the same things going, uh, a lot of these moving parts, but we've introduced virtual reality experiences into this. So we can kind of do a more site-specific uh, experiences, both virtual and actual, and I'm not, how much time do I have left? <laughs> okay, great. So we're, we're doing both of these things, and um, so we're using actual venues. Um, in fact, we're having students go to gallery spaces, um, go to uh, a chapel on the campus and into um, their dorm rooms and trying to engage artworks on iPads, which is not perfect. But then they'll also report their experiences as we put them into virtual reality spaces, um, which is more immersive, obviously, but less real. Um, so they'll enter one of these other spaces. Um, and I'm going to run through this really fast. I know time is going to run out, but so we have um, this way students are encountering projected images in both spaces, not perfect. Our art historians really upset about this, but um, and then in the in the last uh, stage of this, we will actually have them going into the art galleries and into the museums and actually encountering, uh, you know, real live uh, artworks. Um, so just kind of our three virtual spaces, these are much more elaborated now. Um, the students entering virtual reality will enter into um, what is a kind of museum space in which the center object is going to be an information booth and will populate all of these walls with works of art that'll be um, manipulated digitally. And then there's a church space in which the center is the altar and a warehouse in which the center is the uh, supervisor's <laughs> office. And we're including sound with each of these. So there'll be sounds that will be appropriate for chapel, for museum, maybe quiet talking, uh, choir organ practice, and then maybe backup beep, 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 beeps of front, of, of, of front loaders uh, raising materials um, and some shouts perhaps. So we're kind of trying to create somewhat more like a real environment, although I would love to think how we'd incorporate smells <laughs> into this. But, um, and we're finally ending up with all of this. So this is, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a lot, of, a lot of details and a lot of moving parts and all of our questions. But one of the things that happened when our art historian colleagues who are consultants were really upset about the fact that we were manipulating artworks and projecting them digitally, we thought, well, let's make our own artworks. And so we actually, um, one of our psychologists got very busy making up artworks out of using virtual reality practice or um, uh, artificial intelligence practices. And he would say, uh, I, would, I want a picture of the, you know, of well, here, the wedding of Cana in the style of Degas or something. And here he was able to do this one. This is um, the woman at the well. And I think it's an, he has gave it like an abstract expressionist type. And he, he's like very proud of himself. He wants to sell his works now. But um, we wondered if we told people that works were not made by living artists, but in fact by artificial intelligence, would they respond to these differently? And that's added another layer into our studies. And so we actually went on from that for some crazy reason, decided to write a lot of sermons out of chat GBT, 
Um, so we are now working with about 10 different sermons that we um, say a uh, sermon on the prodigal son in the style of Martin Luther King Jr. or Jonathan Edwards or uh, John St. John Chrysostom and having uh, telling people that these sermons are written either by ChatGBT or that they are real and seeing if they have different reactions to them. So now that's at a better full layer to our levels of discussion. I have to say that as um, somebody who's just for the first time in my life worked with psychologists and, and scientists, I'm finding it both challenging and incredibly exciting. So that's our project or projects. <laughs> Can you just advance? Yeah, I'll be I'll be here with you. you. Mean? I'll be here with okay. you. Oh my god. Are we and uh, which one am I? Where am I? CUA twenty three is what it's called. Okay. You're here. Ready this one. Be ready. Is that you? Know? Yes. Yeah. It should be twenty-five. We saw you. Okay. <laughs> Give me one second. Excuse us for having some tech difficulties. <laughs> yeah. We needed your number one. That's how. I'll edit this out for the and in the webinar. <laughs> and. Okay. Hey, that's the last slide. Okay. Me... There we go. Okay, can you can you be here? Yes, let me introduce you. Okay, me minimize and then. There we go. Let me introduce Anne Sussman. Uh, she's an architect, author, and teacher and who's passionate about understanding how buildings influence people. Her book, Cognitive Architecture, Designing for How We Respond to the Build Environment, uh, published in 2021, and co-authored with uh, Justin Hollander, features color images of eye tracking architecture. She's president of the Human Architecture and Planning Institute, thehappy.org. And please. Thank you. Thank you, Julio, and thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo, for being my tech person. <laughs> As a baby boomer, I'm, I can't do it. Um, but this is just really wonderful to be here, and um, I'm very excited. Great. So um, I guess what I'll be talking about is architecture in the 21st century paradigm shift. It's wonderful Julio is doing this. Um, he's really bridging disciplines. And um, this conference acknowledges that we're in amazing times that really can shift here, is this better? That, that really can shift um, how we see our world, ourselves, architecture, how we understand how sacred spaces work as well. Um, okay, next slide. So what I'm gonna show you is a part of this 21st century paradigm shift that we're in now, we now can understand how people actually look at buildings and track it. Um, do you wanna press the video? Yeah, I don't know how to do that. There you go, thanks so much, yeah. And um, so what you can see here is this is a tough student looking at a re recently refurbished library in New York City. Um, and I am following her with iMotion software, tracking her eyes. Um, and you can actually see, I can now tell what she can't tell, that her eyes moved 45 times in 15 seconds. And I can tell exactly how she took in the building. It's quite amazing. Next slide. Um, yeah, go ahead. And then what you can do, you can say, oh my gosh, this is such an amazing tool for an architect, because what you can do next is you can Photoshop out a detail. Let's Photoshop out the arched fenestration. What happens then? Um, you can eye track that and you can say, oh my gosh, the guy, the brain doesn't let him look at the building the same way. Do you see what he ignores, what he doesn't look at? Amir, he, he doesn't see the, he he, well, his brain won't let him look at the blankness. Now he doesn't know his brain is doing that, but I know because I'm eye tracking him. Next. And, and what you can do is then you can compare and contrast how one architectural detail that you might've thought not that significant can completely, exchange, completely change the human experience 
of your building, of your public facility. Um, I've asked about 700 people this question. Um, here are two libraries. Which one would you rather wait in front of while I go park the car? You're going to wait with the books. Do you want to wait with the library um, on the left or the right? Which building do you think people always say they want to wait in front of? Yeah. And they won't know why, but I'll know why because I can understand, I can start to track the non-conscious fixations. Next. Um, and, and that's what the tech people, the car companies, the advertisers, students who go to business schools today now in Boston, that's what they do. Um, they're very stats driven. They want to, they track something that's called the TTFF, the time to first fixation. That is really, really important uh, for people doing marketing. They want to know how quickly someone looks um, non-consciously and what they look at second, third, fourth, and fifth. So in case of analyzing architecture, what's really fascinating, what you see here, we had a 30 people look at the building on the left. We had 33 people look at the building, different people look at the building on the right. What you see here is without conscious awareness or control, they found the front door a fraction of a second faster when it didn't have windows, but by 12 seconds, they're already looking beyond the building. That was fascinating to me. Whereas when the building has the windows, what happens is um, it takes a fraction of a second longer to find the door, but uh, they, by 10 seconds, they're looking beyond the building, but by 12 seconds, they're looking back at the building again. You see? See how powerful this technology is? So you can actually predict how people will behave, whether they will linger in front of your library before it's even built. You can predict which building will be on the postcard. Which building will turn up on the town tourist brochure before it's even built? It's very powerful technology. Next. Um, and so this technology, this is our world today, guys. It's used by Honda, BMW, and GM. I'm using iMotions. What iMotions does, um, they're a global purveyor of bio biometrics. They were founded in Copenhagen. They're now in Singapore, Boston. That's where I am. That's why I met them. Um, they were recently bought by... Um, <laughs> Classic by SmartEye, that's a major company that um, provides biometric tools to the car companies. Um, and what iMotions does is the thing about eye tracking, it doesn't tell you valence, it doesn't tell you emotional experience. So what the big guys do with the money, as Ann Dan was saying, <laughs> with the money, they will combine eye tracking with brainwave measurements, facial expression, heart rate, sweat gland measurement. They really want to get exactly what happens. Okay, they want to know you better than you, better than you know you to promote. You, your engagement with their product and consumption. Next. Okay. And um, this is another quick study we did. Um, this is where, this is um, near Tufts. Uh, the left is the existing um, uh, recently built, um, or not so recently built, uh, car parking garage. And the right, a friend good with Photoshop, fixed it up for me. Where do you think people will prefer to look, the left or the right? All right, there you go. Well, so, it's, so it's not just your guess. Next. Mm -hmm. What, this is the eye tracking. This is what's mind blowing about this. This shows that your brain doesn't let you look um, at the building the same way. Your brain makes you look down the street when there isn't the attractive art on the building. And when there's the attractive art, your brain doesn't let you look down the street. It's pretty fantastic. But then it gets even better, or maybe it's worse. Next. And then play the, play the thing. What this does is um, this measures, this aggregates the data. This is a pilot study. Only 10 people looked at it. It shows it's the big dots are aggregating the data of where they're looked. And then the, the bar graph is actually measuring how many times their face smiled. This is using facet emotion uh, technology, facial expression analysis technology. You have 43 muscles in your face. There's algorithms to predict how you're feeling by how your face is looking. Um, next. And this is what's really fascinating. There's a video there too. When you see, now you can actually see, this is pretty incredible data, how many people smiled, how five people smiled 15, uh, in 15 seconds, three times. You can actually get the biological impact. Um, when you smile, you release this oxytocin, that's the hugging hormone. You could actually make a case that kids will be uh, happier arriving at school passing this building than passing the blank one. Pretty incredible. But by the way, you're never going to see this exact software again because in 2016, Apple bought it and took it off the market. Welcome to our world. <laughs> Next. 
Okay, so, um, but but there are so many other AI softwares coming as I think you were talking about, chatbot and stuff like this. Um, I did teach it at CUA last semester and I introduced my students to 3M visual attention software. That became a plugin uh, for Photoshop in the fall of 2021. Um, and that uh, algorithmically, it's, um, it's as accurate as eye tracking. It predicts how people will look at um, something in the first three to five seconds. In the first three to five seconds, when we look at something, it's exactly the same as a monkey. And it, gender, age, culture doesn't really matter. And what you can see is blank facades just don't appeal to us, just like what we saw with that library I just showed you. Uh, the brain, what you, the left is the heat map, regions of interest drawing. You see that in this building, this is in Ragusa, Italy. One of my students did this. Um, you can see that the brain makes you look around the building, not at it. So really you can understand it won't create a sense of place. Next. And then, then you see here, um, this is actually a lot of, some people have been talking about this at the conference, um, using public art to enhance community and make a sense of place. So now you can actually track how, in this case, this is in Regrusa, they painted a, lo a, a local farmer on the wall, and you can actually see why this was such a compelling, um, a co a compelling addition to the town, how it works, how it changes. Go back one second. Uh, you can change. See, see here, you can't really create, people won't even look at the building then next. Um, it's just suddenly, suddenly, oh my God, you're connecting with the guy. And I think that's one of the things when you start doing these eye tracking, we've been playing with these kind of softwares for about seven years now. When you start doing it, the human face bias is you just can't get over it. Uh, we don't even realize again, it's non-conscious. It's just so there next. Um, and, and we were talking about art, eye tracking the Mona Lisa. Here we go. Without conscious awareness, no wonder 8 million people go to see here. 85% of the people will immediately fo focus on the face, 49 then look at the um, at the hand. And then this shows the, um, the gaze sequence, one, two, three, and four, coming back to the face. Next. And in fact, that's what, it, it, it was so mind blowing to me, our face bias, and I'd never known about this before, that in um, 2018, I gave 19 talks, 18 in the US and one in Berlin, Germany. And before each talk, before I said anything, I said, okay, guys, just tell me where you're from and um, draw a house like it's for a five-year-old or a friend's five-year-old says, draw me a house. What will you draw? And it blew my mind. It didn't matter if they were from Turkey, India, Italy, Spain, Russia, no door in Russia for some reason. Serbia, China, Zambia, they all drew the same thing. Again, what is it you're seeing? The non-conscious brain directing you. That's what you're seeing. Next. Okay. And so that's, so with biometrics, you start to see what we evolved to see as a social species. We're thinking creatures, but we're not as smart as we think. We're responding, we're responding to stuff immediately. This is all buildings in greater Boston. They all have face like facades, they have to. Most of them are now, by the way, protected by historic bylaws. You couldn't take them down if you wanted to. Next. And so that's the amazing thing that came to me after I studied this, after I did these eye tracking studies, when you eye track modern architecture, effectively it collapses. It just doesn't have the, um, it doesn't have the preliminary foundational fixations the brain needs to see to most smoothly regulate. regulate. As Bessel, as Bessel van der Kolk says, the famous MD on trauma, the natural state of the human brain is vigilance, okay? And so the brain needs to see very specific cues that are hardwired in our DNA to get out of the vigilance state. So what you see, the building on the left, that's in Harvard Square, it's now a school protected by a historic district. And without conscious awareness or control, you can see the building on the left. It's now, um, I think that people study science in that building now. Um, the old carriage house, you, it's gonna make an impact on you. The building on the right, a new library in Queens. Subliminally, the brain will focus more on the fire hydrant and the edge of the building. Next. And so you have to understand too, part of the 21st century paradigm shift, we now understand much more about how trauma impacts the brain. This is, um, and um, we, can do, we can do studies with scanners that just didn't exist really, um, the way they do now, magnetic resonance imaging scanners. Um, they really get, became more popular in neuroscience, I'd say around the 1990s, and you can now measure vet brain and how it changes, how PTSD changed the brain architecture. Next. And how it rewires the brain. Okay. Reality is a construct between your eye and brain. That's why when I ask people to draw a house, they all drew faces. Okay, next. And so I presented this at a, at a medical conference in Boston in 2019. It was the 30th annual international trauma conference. 
um, modern architecture, Greg's expression of the trauma of the World War I trench. It turns out Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Neutra, they were all World War I vets. And what happens with PTSD, you lose the cortical regions um, that are responsible for visual processing. You can't take in detail as smoothly. You become fear-based. Remember, non-conscious. The fear can be non-conscious. PTSD stops time. You're still living in the trench, even though you don't know the time has passed. That's the way the brain works. Um, next. Okay, and so um, Gropius' PTSD is in his architecture. All right, so this is his house, uh, six miles from where I live in Lincoln, Massachusetts. And this is a bunker that he would have seen in, in the Western Front. And the house resembles the bunker. Well, in PTSD, your brain keeps replaying stuff. The house has slit windows. You could only see out of any window in the house if you're standing up. It's fear-based architecture. I showed this to Jim Hopper, a professor at Harvard Medical School. He teaches psychology there. And he said to me, oh yeah, it's obvious. It's how trauma works. <laughs> Next. Um, so I'll go back. So I, when I present my, my for learning units, uh, my, my lectures, it's usually the same, and this is what they are. Understand that unconscious behavior outside our conscious control directs our behavior in the built environment. It also directs our purchasing behavior. It's why the car companies use, use this technology. CO biometric tools, including eye tracking and facial expression analysis, can be aggregated to predict behavior, including whether or not people are going to linger in front of your building before it's even built. Um, and learn that architecture is, approach, can, is approachable and avoidant. That's a term neuroscientists use. And it can be, it, it, advertisers apply it all the time. They need to make sure their ads are approachable. Um, learn how evolutionary history presets the human response to external stimuli, including how we're built to look for faces continually without conscious awareness or control. Um, appreciate the meaning and relevance by terms. They're just as relevant. What I would argue is this information is as relevant for architecture as it is for advertising. It's the same brain looking at it. Next. Um, so final thought, traditional architecture mirrors externally our hidden internal brain design. One that a social species requires to promote community. A social species needs community. It needs tribe for its health. It expresses our need to be seen and mirrored and actually how mammals co-regulate. Co we co-regulate by people seeing each other. All right, you can check out more at geneticsofdesign.com. That's our nonprofit's website. And we have some mobile eye tracking software up right now. You can get $5. I'll uh, thank you to our research associate, uh, Abigail. She's here, <laughs> CUA grad. Um, she's here and um, we're using the same software there. These are five minute studies. This is the same software, iMotions Online, that Tesla uses to tweak its car ads. And last slide. Um, and then finally, if you wanna learn more, it's in my book, Cognitive Architecture. The second edition came out with 40 full color image of eye tracked architecture. We think that's a first. And of course, I've got to tell you this story. The first edition, I eye tracked it. I sent it to Routledge and the first edition had the faces and that's where people looked first. I sent that to Routledge. They then sent me the second edition cover, exact same thing. You know, the business world doesn't argue with this science. They just run with it. So um, anyway, we're also having a conference at Tufts. I'm thrilled that Brandon is going to be speaking there. <laughs> and and Abigail will also be speaking there. I'd be happy to talk more about it. We don't want to take too much more of your time. Uh, can the, the four speakers please uh, come to the, the front? <laughs> Have some water there. Elizabeth, I Yeah. So, um, the microphone. thank you, thank you, the four of you, for your presentations. Uh, there's a uh, many points in common. Uh, before I, I may ask question or, or ask the the public. Maybe the first thing is uh, if you have any uh, thoughts or comments to each other. Um, everybody had a chance to to see a little bit of what they are working on. There was exchange of documents. So I wonder if um, among yourself you want to make a comments or 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 say anything. I think the work is fascinating. Just, <laughs> it, it's just so great to see that this fascination is everywhere. You know, uh, really understanding and and finding the words to talk about the human experience. When in the 20th century, just like you know, you were you were talking about it, often wasn't talked about at all, like it wasn't there. And it is there. 
and it is huge and and we have different ways of approaching it but it's really seeking to answer the similar things yeah Thank you. I have something to learn from my research from each of these presentations in terms of atmosphere, representation, non-representation, in terms of uh, eye tracking. And let me just say briefly, in terms of um, the Pantheon ethnographic work, one thing that shows up in, that I found there is the, um, it's the, it's the dome and the oculus that get most of the facial time. <laughs> there. And in the surveys, when people are recounting their associations to the architecture, they're mostly talking about in, in the rotunda, looking up and having to do with the light, the openness, the space, and how their body feels, the bodily reaction, the memories of there. And it's very different. Uh, there's almost no one reports um, uh, new understanding, association, or experience from the individual artworks that are placed in the Pantheon. Almost no one. Um, so you could almost put anything in there around the rotunda, uh, and there's something about the space that's working differently. So it's making me think I'd love to do an eye tracking, a biometric in, inside the space. So that may be another future piece for that work. Yeah. Right. That, that's really fascinating, too, because the human brain, um, like retailers, really do a lot of eye tracking to know where to place things. And basically, the way we look, we tend to look straight out or slightly down and then up. So the fact is they're using a lot of energy to keep looking up. And the face changes when you, uh, sorry, and people's face changes um, when you come through the portal, the, the front door of the Pantheon, there's a there's a notable change in the face that I've never seen anyone write about. So the, the usually the jaw goes down and the eyes go up and the mouth is open for a second or a few seconds. And that's that's um, really interesting. And, I, and, and I, now I know a little more about where I can go with that. I'm not sure what to do with that. But yeah. One thing I know about, I, I'm laughing because I gave my daughter, when she was a senior in college or junior, she went to Rome for a semester and I gave her a guidebook and I tabbed the Pantheon as this is the best building in the world. And she agreed. But, but with what I'm interested in about so much about that is what happens when it rains? Because when you go into the Pantheon, it's raining. It's a, can that, does that change? Yeah, so in the um, survey, uh, in the survey results and also in the... Um, uh, ethnography in the space. Uh, the one of the most common questions is what is is the hole open and what happens when it rains. So there's a there's a real connection to the kind of uh, Anjan was saying yesterday about the nature culture um, kind of slippage, right? And so there's there's a real curiosity about that. Or snow, it can also snow sometimes, rarely, but snow through there, and um, uh, it. But uh, related to that piece is people wanting to know how they relate to what's coming in. Uh, and also um, a piece of the architecture or the design that no one has ever written about as far as I know in terms of visitor experience is people's preoccupation with the drains. Lots of people want to know what, what's up with the drains. What happens when it rains in here? And that's a question that immediately, that's in terms of a thought, as opposed to a feeling or a, a thought is what happens? And then they're, they're looking and people remember that as well. People are writing a lot about the dome, but then the drains. So that's interesting too, kind of like, so there's something there. So yeah, thank you so much for all your presentation. And I think as Anne said, um, it's really interesting how we are trying to understand much better complexity. So we can't use just one approach. We need different points. Otherwise, it's like a fisherman. We have a, a tool, but the science tool has a fixed grid and can grasp all the details of this very complex reality. So I don't know, but in, in my experiment, one of the biggest challenge is that this complexity works on this level because we are so unique. So my experience probably would be very different from your experience maybe in the same place in the Pantheon, probably. And also on this direction, because I'm not always the same person. So what happens if I visit the same building in different weather condition, in different mood, in different predisposition? So it's very complex, but so interesting. I was um, very intrigued about uh, Robin's uh, preliminary uh, discovery that uh, abstract or non-representation art 
perhaps is not liked, but uh, produces uh, a stronger responses and uh, perhaps uh, in the end works better, right? If that's what you want to uh, do. So, uh, and, and this would be uh, the other one that, that Anne is, is saying that, uh, mm. you know, traditional architecture, traditional, uh, perhaps are more friendly, uh, engages us socially, perhaps not consciously. And uh, it goes back to the question of the conscious and the unconscious. Um, a little bit of a feeling versus emotion. Um, so there is this, I think Anjan also was talking about some of the same situations. So would you, would you like to comment on some of this? Anyone? I, I can say that um, in, when we live in, in, my students tend to, I teach a course in history of Christian architecture and a part of what I was telling Anne yesterday is I'm trying to persuade them that they can uh, consider uh, post-Vatican II Catholic churches in the same ways they might consider the very traditional ones, which, which my students tend to prefer, um, possibly for some of the sort of, I, I was laughing with someone saying, you know, I, I've been told by architects that when they design churches, the first thing that building committees want is the one church that they grew up in as children. <laughs> um, so there's a kind of homing, maybe, ho hominess about that. Um, but trying to expand their ex experiences to, to things that they're not as familiar with or don't seem quite as accessible to them. And one of the things that's very important, I think, is what I call the docent experience, a docent effect, in which people, if they're prompted and trained a little bit, they'll have a new experience of a space. So how much does that matter? So it makes a big difference if I'm talking to a major in psychology or a major in industrial design. Because the 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 in the preparation, the training, the intellectual preparation will be different, and so they will have different responses. Kind of why I asked that question about law students and architects yesterday. I don't know. I'm I, I they at least the very least I can say is that in trying to figure out what they're looking at, whether they like it or they don't like it, they spend longer time looking at it, and they remember it better because they do. Any yes. Okay. Harrison. So I think it's wonderful that we have the Pantheon as um, a subject here. And the thing that interests me is the Pantheon performs. The light comes through the oculus and shines on different parts of the building. And so I'm curious if you did time studies, whether the eye tracking would start to isolate on some of these various places. Also, it reminds me of, you know, the James Turrell sculptures where you go into a round room and there's a hole and it suddenly makes you see actual real atmosphere. You see clouds, you see fog in San Francisco anyway. And depending on the light change, the whole room changes. So there's a kind of performance. So time is so critical in that building. And also, I love the idea that it rains and they have to have drains and all of that. So suddenly there's this notion of process that is critical to how the building takes on meaning. So I'm wondering how the eye tracking over time might do this. So you eye track on a sunny day, you eye track on a cloudy day, you eye track when it's raining, you suddenly build in the full environmental um, condition of a place for your sense of meaning. Because that's what cities and architecture really engage. And in many cases, a city is so different when it rains. It's so different when it's cloudy, you know, it's so different when it's super windy. So it's those things that I think would be really fun to go back and do. So you should keep working on the Pantheon, <laughs> get these eye tracking things. Can you add to that when it's crowded or it's not crowded? Yes, absolutely. Crowded. Yeah, so that, that that gets to the whole affordance thing because, you know, we are herd creatures and if one of the 
performance is, is actually a religious performance. It's one kind of experience. If it's you have to walk around the perimeter because they have those railings up. Um, I just think you're you're just starting. <laughs> And then Michael. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I uh, am a philosopher, and philosophers always ask about presuppositions rather than so it's, it's a bit of a bore, and people don't like it. But anyway, for what it's worth, I am struck by three presuppositions. First of all, all the presentations have been about the visual, and this reflects, I think. Uh, a kind of prejudice uh, that can be tracked back to the 18th century, in which visual art is thought to be the form of art. So much so, in fact, that it was quite common for people to talk about other arts as a form of painting. So music was painting in sound, a ballet was uh, painting in movement. But this is, I think, a prejudice. And uh, and if you were if you're really interested in the arts, uh, then this emphasis on the visual, uh, I think, is seriously deficient. And um, this is particularly important in uh, some of the presentations here because because if you move away from the visual, eye tracking is not especially important. Um, and similarly, uh, you will have doubts about whether uh, virtual, the, the experience of virtual presence, which is visual, is going to capture much about uh, what it is here. So, so that's my first comment is just, I think there is a question to be raised about this emphasis on the visual. It's not this panel, of course. I mean, this is a, quite, quite a general thing. The second, th second thing I'd, I'd say that strikes me is this, <clears throat> and it was particularly marked in, in Anne's presentation, but uh, there's a supposition that that which is uncovered by the data uh, is in some sense an access to the real. And so Anne's presentation has this, to my mind, slightly odd division between the brain and the person. So I think you used the expression a few times, your brain is making you say. And philosophically speaking, this is very strange formulation. Alan Shore, it's the 21st century paradigm shift. Alan Shore writes about it. It is a difference. It's a complete paradigm shift. And then the visual bias, that's science. Trust me, the car companies wouldn't be using it if it didn't work. Oh, I don't know the yeah. people that do it. But I, I'm, I'm it, it is upsetting. Oh, I, I'm not upset by any of this. <laughs> not remotely. I'm raising critical questions. That's we realize what. thinking it's is utterly important as we think. It's <laughs> utterly familiar. Also, may I just say, I don't think there's a paradigm shift. Materialism of this kind has been around for centuries. It keeps recurring. In philosophical thinking, these cycles come, they go, they come, they go. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything especially novel about this, but um, and certainly it's not upsetting. I mean, it's well, familiar. I think what's novel about it is now you can get the stats, and what's novel about it too is now they really have the science. I mean, I think that the issue with vision is it is really important. I think the information science is eleven million bits of information. A bit is unit of information. Go, go into your brain. 11 million bits of information go into your brain every second. When you're awake, 10 million of them are visual. 1 million is touch. And then 50 are conscious. Yeah, we're not going to agree in there. Yeah, well, that's because I think stats are. Yeah, well, that's, but that's, but that's, I think, some of the science that it's why the car companies invest in this technology. Oh, sure. You know, and because it works. Um, well, it works. We're much more, much more manipulatable than you realize. I, I don't deny that. I just deny that uh, the power to manipulate and even predict is in any sense uh, an insight or illuminating about the nature of uh, aesthetic experience. I just deny that. But well, well, I must stop. Someone else wants to. Well, can you respond on the visual? Thing? Yeah, sure. 
after the after the finisher. So thank you so much for this question also because it gives me the opportunity to explain that yeah. Every time we try to understand much better experience, there are so many variables. So as Anjan said yesterday, it's an incremental growing up process. I started with sketches and this time people could walk. So it's true. She and I were mainly visual, but we had also some haptic sensations. So they could see, they could open the door. The carpet in the virtual reality was the same carpet that we had in the real room. So we tried to match this kind of haptic sensation under, under our feet. Um, there were some sounds the of the doors, some connection with the context because we were in a lab, but not in the middle of nowhere. So there was another door trying to explain people that if you hear something, it comes from there. Don't worry, you are not in the bubble. You are absolutely right, but we are just trying to do that step by step. So we are aware that it's a limitation, especially when you work with atmosphere. Uh, people could walk, but they had an arse sling and headset. So I completely agree. It's just a way to improve what we did yesterday. I hope that tomorrow we will be able to experience everything <laughs> if we can, but it's very complex. Let me just add that, and in terms of, I mean, we are trying to pay attention to environment. We're not going to do what Jonathan does with music, and we only hear about that. But um, for us, environment is a big part of this. You know, what time of the day, what season of the year, what's happening around you? Is a choir practicing in the basilica? Are you hearing birdsong in the sculpture park? These are not, they're not, the, don't sound like they may be our major focus, but they're certainly a big part of what affects the viewer's experience. Um, how many people are around you? How crowded is the space? Have you have an exam tomorrow? I mean, all of that is all part of the emotional in encounter too. So, and we're hearing about all of that. So I think it's a multi-sensory study. And I think we probably do need to be much more conscious of the levels of other, the other senses being engaged. But I think we're trying a little bit to do that. So uh, it's a great question. And I, in the... Pantheon survey, we ask people about sound, we ask people about smells, and we ask people about uh, bodily responses to the space. And uh, there's, I won't go into that now, but we do have a lot of information about that. And also, you know, related to this question is, what I found in the architectural literature about Pantheon studies is a lot of architects have their ideal bodily um, posture in the space. Uh, so it's not just the ideal visual about about how you get the meaning of a building like that, but it's about the ideal body in the space, which is interesting and complicated. So William McDonald, in his rich work on the Pantheon, says the Pantheon is really about standing in the middle with your arms extended, right? And then you understand what this space is, and then you get its spirituality. That's an important claim. Other architects say, no, you stand against the rotunda with your arms up against the wall. So it's really interesting how you derive the sacrality based on the ideal posture in architectural literature. Well, uh, <laughs> there's been so much there. It's, I, I have this problem with what do I say first? Um, so I think the first thing I would say is, is that architecture is not there for the aesthetics. That's sculpture. And to think of buildings as large sculptures, which is what we're in danger of doing, lacks a great deal. Once you start saying, well, I'm in an auditorium, how do I find my seat? Uh, how good are the acoustics? Or I'm in my house, where's the goddamn bathroom? Um, then, then we begin to understand how the visual plays a role, but it's not an exclusive role. Uh, I, I'm currently working with a blind architect. So in fact, there is such a thing as architecture without vision, and we haven't done studies of eye movements with blind subjects, although actually they, they turn out to be head movements rather than eye movements. Um, but I, I wanted to just pick on a couple of things. Um, one is I was very struck by the outdoor sculptures of the uh, Stations of the Cross. And you didn't say explicitly, but I assume it's true, that the people who stopped to analyze it knew what the Stations of the Cross were, and they were trying to figure out how the hell does this relate, well, actually, how the heaven does this relate to, uh, to, to the fourth Station of the Cross and so on. 
So, so maybe you could do that and then I will attack Anne. Um, most of them do because most, uh, 75 or maybe 80% of our students are Roman Catholic backgrounds, maybe not practicing or maybe not terribly pious and going to church, but most of them would know what the Stations of the Cross are. Um, and that comes back, though, to the question of prompts and, and what I call what people come, what they bring already in knowledge. And I would say that those 14 stations don't track exactly on the same traditional 14 stations. So there's actually a nativity station in there, but the artist didn't identify, there's no plaques. There's, there's, no, there's no sort of like, uh, you know, labels for these stations. So they have to kind of try to figure them out and they come up with different answers. About no, what they are. I, that's good. But I, I think I would like a control of just checking how well informed about the stations of the cross each person is, and then seeing how you can get that dimension into the data. Well, that's part of the questionnaire that we give them, you know, sort of how much, I mean, we can't really ask them. We, there's, there's always this question that psychologists know better than I do about how much to tell people before you start the study so that you don't contaminate the study. Um, but we are interested in the levels of their religious knowledge, yeah. um, maybe in a more general way. Yeah, Julio has done some nice post study interviews where you can ask those who, who is i'm sorry julio bermudez our <laughs> genial host oh, that guy. remember him he was you may you may have corresponded with him in the past anyway i want to turn to Anne, and i i i'm very worried about um your evangelism because you you have people look at pictures and then you madly over interpret uh, so, for example, you were delighted at somebody putting a painting on a building and then getting more attention to the building. But the whole point was that it wasn't attention to the building. So you only need that painting if it's lousy architecture, because the building itself is not interesting. And then you compared this converted barn house, whatever it was, with this bland library. And you look at the, the, the heat map in terms of um, no prompt at all. Now, consider I'm walking down the street and there are various buildings that I'm told, look for the library. Now, in that case, what was interesting there was that visible through the windows on the second floor were the books stacked in their shelves. And so if you had given the person the question, um, you show them several pictures and for each one, tell me, is it a library? Uh, then, in fact, you would have seen a completely different heat map. I think we discussed some time ago the classic study of eye movements by Yarbus, a Russian psychologist in 1957, I think, where subjects were shown Ryepin's painting. Uh, he was not expected of a man as suddenly at returned home from, from the gulag. Um, and what happens is Yarbus asked people questions. They just scan it, and then you would get your heat map or um, estimate how old they are, and you get a heat map that focuses just on the faces. And then you say, uh, another question is, remember the um, clothes people are wearing. And then what you get is a heat map that goes to faces, because that's the easy way, because of the color contrast and the, the ovoid and so on, to get each person distinguished from the ground. And then you get a scan up and down as you locate each face. And so I'm very worried about the brain tells you to do and the non-conscious is forcing everything. In this case, in the real world, you're in a cycle where you don't know how your brain is telling you that's how you find a face. Um, but you are guiding it by, I want to find a face to estimate age, or I want to find a face so I can look at the, the clothing and so on. So I, I really want to insist on coming up with theories of what are the actions we want to perform? What are the questions we want to answer? And then what is then the cycle between the conscious and the non-conscious? Yeah, th those are really good points. Those are really good points. I, I, I think something else I wanted to talk about briefly was the feeling of awe. And it doesn't matter the liturgy, really. So I was in Sagrada Familia, where you know, which Anjan showed, and then I've been to the Pantheon. And what's interesting is I think about it. This is a couple of years ago now. The feeling of awe was very similar, and I knew I was in some place special. And maybe I didn't know Latin or Italian or 
uh, Spanish, I, why? And that was the amazing thing. The architecture brings the world together through time. And as a social species, that's really what we need. We need the community and it worked so well. So it, it, what's so interesting, it becomes timeless. It's timeless, even though the, the times have very much changed <laughs> and yet it still works. And I can imagine, when was the Pantheon built now? Uh, in the round 120. So yeah, I would imagine when someone entered it in 200, had they had the same feeling I had when I went in 2010. You know what I'm saying? The exact same. And that's what's amazing, being able to experience humanity that way. Same thing with um, Sagrada Familia. Just one last, we had to finish this, but I cannot resist to ask. Her. Thanks. Um, uh, just a quick comment about awe, and then have a question for both uh, Robin and Tom. Um, the little bit of empirical work on awe suggests that vastness and looking up seems to be a critical thing. And there's at least one experiment I can think of where the same painting is placed at different heights, and the higher it's placed, the more it evokes a sense of awe. For what the mechanism is behind that, I don't know, but it's an observation. Uh, my question for both of you is, do you find a distinction between what is sacred and what is not? So for Robin, you also had abstract art that was not sacred, however, that was defined. And is it the case that people also struggle to find meaning in non-sacred abstract art? Is there something qualitatively different about that? And the parallel question for Tom is that the Pantheon as you point out, brings in all kinds of people, some who come to it with the notion that this is a sacred space and others, it's, it's, it's a tourist attraction, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it is of historical significance, but might not be entered into as a basilica. And from your, in, from your data, is the experience of both those two groups different? So for Robin, it's the experience of sacred versus not non-sacred abstract art. For Tom, the same space, whether someone comes in with the notion uh, uh, prior that this is a sacred space with that, or it's not a sacred space. I'm holding the mic, so I'll start. <laughs> I'll pass it to Tom. One of the things that I think we are looking at is also the differences among people. So that um, I would, I, I think the answer to your question has a lot to do with the viewer and what they come bringing to the image and how much they want to find in it. And so a non-sacred abstract piece, something let's just say Jackson Pollock or something. Now, some people will find that very, very sacred. Um, not a lot, but there, that will happen. Others will say, well, that's monkey vomit, <laughs> you know, and my two-year-old could do that. And so some of that inter interviewing, I mean, having some basic information about the viewers is really helpful. I would say that in, in the, along with the Stations of the Cross, I did show them the Rothko Stations Chapel. And the hostility that I <laughs> got from many people um, about that was to say that something which is of intentionally sacred, get put in a chapel, but is non-figurative, and it was very negative experience for people, obviously many people, and yet others found it incredibly moving. So it can really change from person to person. And I think it's what the, the, why the question of who the viewer is is so important to us as well. And so we can't make any definitive conclusions about what how this all works across a whole population. Yeah, thank you. I mean, your questions, Anjan, are really part of my obsessions. So I... Uh, but I'll be very brief. So one thing for me, just two responses. One would be the definition of sacrality, right? It's part of the stake, one stake of this conversation overall, I think. And we get a definition from you. Uh, we get de various definitions. Uh, or, you know, here we get definitions are coming out directly and indirectly. Um, so I just think there's a huge semantic range to deal with on that topic. And um, for myself, I have to have a scratch definition of spirituality as a theologian that I'm working with and, you know, dealing with the whole tradition that I inherit around that too. So for myself, uh, I, I, 
parse out spirituality as reckoning with claiming powers regarding what matters. That's how I think about spirituality, reckoning with claiming powers regarding what matters, because it's, I can explain that definition in another venue if you want, but that's, that's what I work with. So um, what do we see in terms of people, the Pantheon is a place where people will wander in because it doesn't, there's no, until, until this week or last week, there's no entrance fee. Now for the first time ever, it's a five euro entrance fee, right? But it used to be free, and it was the most popular cultural monument in all of Rome. Nine, almost 10 million people visited in 2019, okay? You can just walk in off the piazza. A lot of people go, don't know it's a church. A lot of people go through it and don't realize it's a church. That's true. We see that in the data. So one difference vis-a-vis -vis sacrality, to your question from the survey, is we ask, it's the Basilica of Mary and the Martyrs, Santa Maria ad Martyrs. So uh, did you encounter Mary in this space, right? This is, the, this is one major point of the Roman Catholic ministry is that this is Mary's space, right? Now, um, people who do not come in with a Catholic background by and large, overwhelmingly do not report an encounter with Mary or Christ or God. We asked about all three, right? We asked about all three. Um, Roman Catholic uh, identified persons are more likely to say that they, uh, re that they had a positive association with the Marian artwork. But still, overall, um, a relationship to a religious persona is not the majority experience in the space, whether you are identified as Roman Catholic or not identified as Roman Catholic. That's why I think of this as very interesting for ecclesiology, that is the theology of churches, because this is a really interesting example of a more than Christian church. We don't have a lot of more than Christian churches. So I think it's actually a prospectively um, fruitful concept. Okay. I think we need to we need to we need to conclude. I'm, you guys keep talking during the break, otherwise we won't make it to the next session. So uh, please uh, take a break and come back in twenty minutes. Thank you.